Rural Heritage on RFD TV is brought to you by Rural Heritage Magazine, a bi monthly magazine featuring articles about farming and logging with draft animal power, small scale diversified family farming and homesteading, and other aspects of our rich rural heritage. Rural Heritage Magazine, borrowing from yesterday to do the work of today. For subscription information, please call 319 362 3027 or order online at www.ruralheritage.com. Hi, I'm Joe Mishka. Welcome to another episode of Rural Heritage TV. When early European settlers came to the Lancaster, Pennsylvania area, they built mills along rivers to use the unrelenting force of flowing water to provide a variety of mills fitted with a variety of paddle wheels and turbines. In his book, Mills of Lancaster County, Donald Kotz provides a comprehensive examination of these. I met Donald when I visited the mascot mill in Rocks, Pennsylvania, and got a tour by James Landis. James is the executive director of the Wrestler Mill Foundation, which is charged with restoring and preserving the mill as part of its threefold mission. So the uh, three parts of our mission are mainly to keep the mill and the home in good shape. And I think of those really not for the next five years, but the next 50 and 100 years. Uh, the second purpose is education. And then the third is to save this, uh, the creek, the stream, and soil. If you're, if you're gonna preserve soil and creek, creek banks and that sort of thing, you need to have trees. These are actually coming out on Tuesday. These are, uh, I, think, I think these are, that's a pawpaw tree. Uh, this is persimmons. Red oak, we got, we got wow. uh, a bunch of hickories in there. And these are all going into a, uh, a riparian area. So they're coming out, and these, these are really fascinating. These hickories are that high. They're roots. Yeah, they? right? <laughs> they're yeah. tap root. They really tap down. Right? They tap down, yeah. So you might as well start with the tour of the mill by starting with what is a requirement, dam a stream, the power, and the dam uh, has about a 14-foot fall from there over to the bottom of the, where, where the water goes out. Th th that's an incredible number because that means you have 14 feet of head mm -hmm. above the turbines. And you can't, you know, some people have six-foot heads and then they have to have a much larger turbine to be able to actually spin the horsepower. Mills of Lancaster County author and photographer Donald Katz told us a little about Mills in general and what was unique about the wrestler's mascot mill. Yeah, okay, well this is uh, one of the few remaining water-powered grist mills that are still running. Um, there were almost 400 of them at one time. Um, now there are only maybe 100 still standing, but only two that run, and this is one of them. At one time, there were um, three uh, overshot water wheels here, two for the mill, and there was a sawmill uh, out front that ran uh, the third wheel for that. And then uh, and they were running uh, two sets of um, grindstones, wow. one for flour and one for corn, I presume. And um, But then... Um, you know, toward the turn of the century, they upgraded the system and replaced the overshot wheels with turbines and replaced the uh, stones with uh, roller mills on the flower side and then the attrition mill on the, on the corn side. And then that's what they were running up until 1977 when, when the last miller retired. You can see artifacts of the old mill like right here. Uh -huh. This was the, the, the way they brought material into the mill in bags. There was no bulk kind of operation. They brought it in in bags and they had a, a rope, a slack rope system. And there's still a slack rope system. When they changed everything in, in 1906 to 1912, they switched out the, and they started bringing the grain in bags up here. So maybe oh, an interesting thing would be to follow in your mind where, how grain came in, and we can go to the second floor and, and then, you know, we'll get a picture of, of an idea of that. Perfect. 
uh, so we have soft winter wheat in this area. Okay. And that's what he milled. Okay. As opposed, and this is used for um, for cakes, pies, and that sort of thing. Okay. Baking flour. Baking flour. Okay. Bread flour is a, is a hard winter wheat that you know says think North Dakota, Saskatchewan, Minnesota. Sure. At this point, Tyler Morton turned on the power to the mill by opening the floodgates. Is he opening the gate right now? Yeah. It's a little bit of cold, stiff. <laughs> now, it, this usually runs a lot faster. You have it open the whole way, don't it's, you? Yeah, it's it's cold. It's gonna. If you want to have be up to speed, it's gonna take half an hour, forty-five minutes. Yeah. So the best thing to do might just be to let it run for a while. So this is like a governor. Oh, it's a governor, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And as it goes, gets up to speed, it the the balls flow out sure. and it raises it to this place right here where there is no there's no the bell stops. Uh, camp. Yeah, okay. So the bell stops. So he and if it of course if it goes it the bell gets loud. Ding 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 yeah. ding ding ding. Right, okay, faster. Okay. So um th this he knew that he couldn't start the process of running wheat through it until he had no sound. Turbines, we have two different kind of turbines in this, and that gets pretty technical. But a turbine is basically sitting, it's, it's this sort of thing here on one of them, the other one's a bit larger. Uh, this one actually has more horsepower than the larger one does. But if you look at this, this is sort of a study of it. Um, this is the, the shaft, the vertical shaft that goes up from the, this is sitting in, in 14 feet of water. Okay. And uh, when you want to run it, you open a gate, set of gates, and we have two. One of them slides like that, and one of them opens like shutters. Okay. This one is the shutter type, or wicket gates, that they're called. And the water comes in here and then drives this runner. The vertical shaft is this, goes up through. And uh, then we'll see down below in the sub-basement what that looks like. Okay, great. So this is a, you know, you got the headwater, you got the penstock, you got the turbine, and you got the tailwater. Okay, that's, that's. So that get, lays it out. really helps. And then this goes up, runs a wooden wheel, that runs a metal wheel, that runs a line shaft. Jim turned us over to Tyler Morton for some of the tour. Tyler does a lot of the work restoring and maintaining the mill and knows a lot of its history. This is a time capsule of communication of people who lived during the depression. Everything around here for the most part is reuse or repurpose of another material. The stair treads on the staircase below us still have slots in them where you can tell they're old floorboards that were pulled up that were floorboards in the mill and probably pulled up when they did a refit and the slots are where belts would have run down to the next floor or above or something like that. So uh, nothing was thrown away main receiving floor so okay. we'll be bringing sacks of grain from the wagon below and you know here's the uh, slack line Sl slack rope uh, system lift that yep. brings it up there yep. would have been a rope about here <laughs> that you pull to engage the sack lift and that's um, powered by the by the turbines as well the, the yep. water yeah. is like it's always turning and then uh -huh. when you pull the rope it engages, engages. a clutch that uh, makes the Makes Very the cool. lift go up. Very There's cool. a belt that runs from the basement, well, the penstock area, which is almost in the basement, the whole way to the fourth floor. And on the fourth floor, that's where the clutching mechanisms and everything are for the slack rope system, which are all friction drive. Okay. So uh, flat belt pulleys and, and friction drive, uh, which we can see then. So here so. you can see the clutch for the slack slack belt so oh, wow so these guys are be turning you know under water power yeah and then when you want to run the hoist you pull that rope and it tightens it up wow and then spins the uh, 
That's a big bobbin up there. Huge right. witch. <laughs> the, the, the drum spins and winds the rope, and uh, of course there's a brake on it there and everything, and uh, that's what brings your bags up that to whatever so floor you want to take cool. them to. So let's say if we're bringing in wheat, right? So we're going receiving in here, and then it, and then it goes in here onto the scales, and you weigh the wheat coming in, and and then it's after it's been weighed, it gets dumped down that trap door and goes into the receiving bin, and then from there it goes into the basement where it goes through a cleaner to get rid of any leftover chaff or whatever dirt that's mixed in with it. Um, and then Franklin would uh, actually collect the dirt that came off of the cleaner okay. and weigh it separately and subtract, subtract the weight of the dirt from the weight of the grain okay. coming in. Okay. So the, the farmer's grains, they get mixed um, at, in the mill itself, the roller mill, mm -hmm. depending on how much people are bringing in? So when, when and, and we're specifically talking yeah. about wheat in this situation. Okay. So uh, when wheat would come in, it, it would they would do exactly as Don uh, described. And a lot of times in the threshing process, which was done on the farm, uh, <laughs> you had good threshermen and you had not as good threshermen. So uh, that all was related to machine adjustment, um, fan speeds and separating, literally separating wheat from chaff and how good a job the thresherman was doing. And if the thresherman was doing a poor job, then there would be dirty wheat coming into the mill. And uh, it's recorded in some of the interviews that were done with Franklin. A lot of times he could tell and ask the farmers, did so-and-so thresh your wheat? And the farmers would say, yeah, how did you know? And uh, if, you know, just like everything else, uh, reputations are developed. Franklin knew who was a good thresherman and who needed to improve on their skills a little bit. And uh, at the same time, too, as a miller, he wanted to pay for grain. He didn't want to pay for right. you know stuff he couldn't use. Dirt, yeah. So of course, it would go through the the separator or cleaner, as Don, Don described, and Franklin was making sure he only paid for grain. Okay, so while we're here, then. Yep. Um, so after the grain has been cleaned, then it'll, it gets, it's done in the basement. It gets picked up on an elevator and we're brought upstairs for storage. An elevator like this? Actually, that's the yeah, exact like that. one. Yep. Yeah, okay. so that's, okay, that's yep. one of the things uh, we're working on right now. That section was pulled here. Uh, this, this is the main receiving elevator right in front of the scales. Um, goes from below the basement the whole way to the cupola on the outside. At the top of that, there's a distributor to send it to any number of storage bins or into the first break of the roller mill uh, for the first step of the process of grinding the wheat into flour. Yeah, okay. And this is this is the uh, distributor here. So. Oh really? This okay. this thing you can swing around and it selects which destination <laughs> the grain's going to drop into. That's exactly right. Wow. So how he kept track of what was where, I don't know. But, uh, wow. <laughs> well, you figure if he's working in here every single day. Yeah, he just knows uh, it, how he does it. Exactly. It you exactly. You know yeah. where things are going. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it just takes time. But if it's something that somebody does every single day, they're going to know. So this is what James was talking about. This is the brand cleaner. Okay. So the brand's going through here. To, it separates the so if there's any, any mixed in flour you want that out to keep that in the so it's sifting it here it's a no, no well kind of a duster sifter yeah so there's two different size screens this is a conical drum that uh, changes diameter as it goes down so materials flowing in one end coming out the other and uh, of course like i said different size screen meshes there yeah. to separate the different sizes of material so you're, you're, you're separating in sizes. In the floor here, it's, it's a little tough to tell because this actually sits almost on the floor, but there's chutes below here that take it and send it down again to uh, the correct step in the roller mill process and uh, either separating that out and, and sending the brand to 
uh, a bagger or uh, taking other material and sending it back through the sieve folders or back through the roller mills and uh, continuing it, continuing to grind it down further into smaller, smaller particle sizes until you get the flour. So we are walking through, you know, one of the storage bin areas now. Um, yeah, you can see these chutes and, everywhere. Right, and, and with the light here, you can kind of see some of these grooves a little bit better. Right. Mm -hmm. As to how they would be built. But this is, this is part of the dust collection system. Uh, the dust collection system actually ran uh, multiple floors. There's, uh, I don't know if you talked about the air duct on the first floor there above the roller mills. We didn't do that yet. Okay. Uh, but that, that air duct above the roller mills would take flour dust. and <laughs> dust and really those are your finest particle sizes. So that's, that's your best flour. That's your best flour, right, okay. right. Huh. Very, right. very, very light, so much so that they're floating around in the air. Um, there's a draft fan that's hooked up as part of the dust collection system over here, which pulls the air through this air duct system up to this floor and then sends that air through through this mechanism and this is these are um, almost like a felt felt like material yeah, right and uh, the particles that the air is forced through there the particles would be captured on that material and then this rotates and I'll see if I can get it going here maybe you can see the mechanism a little bit but they'd be clapped and knocked, huh. and then the flower particles would fall off that belt into an auger here, and then down a chute again into further steps in the process where the flower is then sent to either the barrel packer or a holding bin or something along those lines that is for the final packing. So these are uh, these are uh, legs for the uh, flour mill system. Uh, there's 12 total that are part of the sieve boulder and roller mill stand systems that again take uh, material of different sizes depending on where it's at in the system and bringing it up taking it down and distributing it to any number of machines. These are the top, so the, yeah, yeah, these the belt's are the tops. coming up and then going right. around and back down. So, so there's um, conveyors with shovels, I mean belts with shovels on them that are bringing that's, material that's up? That's right, that's right. right. I'll see if I can open this one up here. So there's, uh, yeah, from, from, you know, the first, uh, first break, we say, uh, you know, there's four roller mill stands with eight breaks. And uh, in addition to that, there's the brand finisher that we saw. There's also middling mills. And, uh, of course, the two sieve boulders that are separating things into material sizes. Uh, but everything's got to go somewhere, and it has to have a way to get there. So um, the way that is is through gravity and all these legs. This, yeah. this is the line shaft for the, so this, this pulley here that I'm standing at right now is the one that runs, normally there would be a belt on here, we're in the process of replacing that, okay. uh, that runs from down in the penstock area the whole way up here to the fourth floor, and it's connected to a line shaft which drives a number of things. This, this set of legs here is for uh, what we call the scourer. So uh, if the miller, or Franklin, who was the miller here in the last generation, uh, had wheat that was smutty, so you know you have a damp growing season and uh, starting to get uh, some smut on it, uh, he'd send it through the scourer to, to try and clean it up. These legs feed those machines, that, that machine. There's a lot going on. Yes. Yes, there is. That's what uh, James meant when he said it was a System. Yep, absolutely. And it's all dependent on each other. You know, you remove one part of the system and you can't do anything else in it. It breaks down. Yep.
So th we're, we're in the area now where the pen stock is located, uh, directly below us underneath this floor. This is the area where uh, prior to the refit into turbines where a water wheel would have been. But um, we're, we're standing over top of the pen stock, which is where the head race comes into the mill. And uh, the turbine we see, uh, the gears we see running here are connected below us in the pen stock to a 24 inch Vince Burnham turbine. That, and that's a straight shaft going down to the turbine. Correct, correct, correct. And uh, they are uh, cast iron pieces fitted with uh, wooden gear teeth. Uh, we keep them lubricated with wax. And uh, that's what's driving a line shaft that goes into the basement, which we'll go see then. That uh, drives the roller mill stands and uh, when connected, also has a belt to the second floor, which drives all the machinery, uh, such as the seat folders and, and some other pieces on the second floor and higher. And, and this, if, if we come around here, this, this pulley we see spinning now yeah. is also the same one that would drive that belt that goes the whole way to the fourth floor. Okay. You ever get goosebumps working on this stuff? But knowing that you're grabbing stuff that was grabbed a hundred years ago and you can actually see the wear on it from people and stuff like that, or is that pretty much gone, the goosebumps? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I get some goosebumps. Um, a lot of times, and, and this is unique to this situation, so I don't know how far you've gotten into this so far already, but um, when Franklin and Anna left, they packed a suitcase, they walked out the door, and that was it. Everything else, they left untouched. Really? Yeah. Uh, there was no packing up and going away, aside from the suitcase that they took each. Um, they, the, 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 they, they pretty much left the place as they walked out the door. Wow. And, and that was intentional. That was okay. intentional. So uh, for me, I get goosebumps when, uh, of course, a lot of this older machinery has specialized tooling or um, you know, unique parts and pieces that um, have been replaced or need to be replaced or swapped out over time, depending on what you're doing. And uh, I get goosebumps when I'm working on something and I need a special tool or, or need to replace something and I go, okay, now, I have to think like Franklin. Anything that I would need for this machine probably is within reach. And you might not see it, but that doesn't mean it's not within reach. Look up under tucked in rafters, look behind corners, look behind uh, you know, some of the, the grain legs where there's you know, little voids and little spaces where stuff could be stored, but you're not going to see it. Right. So uh, there's been a lot of times that I've found things we've been looking for because you got to put yourself in the mindset of you know, the Miller or Franklin and say, all right, it's got to be close by somewhere. It's, it's, it's right here. Now, where is it? <laughs> And that's that's pretty cool. That's that's a special experience. That's not something you can get everywhere else. That's awesome. At one point in our visit, the men heard a slightly different sound in the rhythm of the machinery. I don't know what that's about. I don't like it. That sound? <laughs> yeah. 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 It is a very different feel right now when you turn that off. It is so quiet here. <laughs> it really is amazing. This program is available for purchase. To order your copy, please call 319-362-3027 or visit www.ruralheritage.com. Rural Heritage is a bi-monthly magazine dedicated to draft animal farming and logging as well as other aspects of our rich rural heritage. It is published by Mishka Press, which also offers a complete line of back-to-the-land books, DVDs, and calendars. Call or write for a catalog or subscription information, or visit our website at www.ruralheritage.com.